Well, it's already astounding to think of your place as one in eight billion people on Earth. But what about your place on just one of billions of planets in the galaxy, which is just one of billions of galaxies in the universe? Well, sheer probability suggests that there's almost certainly other forms of life somewhere out there. But how do you define what life is and what might extraterrestrial forms of it look like? Well, for more, Natalie Cabrol joins us for Perspective. She's an astrobiologist and researcher at the SETI Institute in California. I hope I got those, those numbers more or less right. Dr. Cabrol, thank you for joining us. Hi, good morning. So most people are familiar with astronomy, cosmology, even more and more astrology. But what exactly is astrobiology? What do you research? Astrobiology is the search for life in the universe. And uh, there are some um, fundamental questions uh, about that. Uh, are we alone? Um, what is uh, the abundance and distribution of life in the universe and what's the future of life on Earth and elsewhere? So what does your research on Earth look like to try and answer some of those questions? So um, basically we cannot go every single day to other planets and, and there are places uh, on Earth that are very similar to uh, what other planets look. Uh, for instance, when we were preparing the uh, Mars Exploration Rover missions, uh, we, we went to places uh, in the Andes, very high uh, where you have lots of UV radiation, where the temperature is cold, etc., which is the environment that's very similar to Mars uh, about four billion years ago. So we prepare in those analogs. We call them analogs. Um, I imagine when, when looking for life on other planets, we're not talking about uh, what we might see in films, aliens with two eyes that actually, at the end of the day look like humans or even humans uh, uh, like ourselves. So how do you define uh, what life is and could look like other than what we know? So uh, a number of questions here. First, we don't have a definition of life. We have working definitions of life. There are 123 of them. So, and, and I'm uh, among the, those who, who believe that there is no definition of life but a description. Uh, this is all we have right now. Um, and as far as biology is concerned, uh, I agree with you that, well, first, statistically, there are so many, many possibilities that even by accident, there is something somewhere that looks a little bit like us. And plus, nature has a way of responding to some challenges. And although um, an octopus is not looking exactly like us, we know that on Earth, the eyes, for instance, have been created by nature 32 times independently. So there are responses of nature to some question, and life needs to interact with its environment to understand it. To, um, so it is likely that you might not have eyes like us, but you will have something that senses what's happening around, touches stuff. So um, we don't have a definition of life. We know that even by accident, something is going to look like us, but also uh, lots of possibilities for many, many different types of life. Uh, some theories, to, to tail end off of what you said, posit that the conditions that brought about intelligent life as we know it, what you just described, two eyes able to sense what's happening uh, around us, the conditions that brought that on Earth are so particular, so unique, that it's actually rather improbable uh, that those processes could have fallen into place so perfectly in other circumstances. Why do you not subscribe to those theories? So uh, this is the uh, uh, rare Earth hypothesis, and this one uh, has been uh, um, proposed like 10, 12 years ago, and that was before uh, the Kepler mission, before we knew how many uh, planets actually existed. So um, I don't know if things fell perfectly in place here. This is the type of life we know. Uh, but uh, we also know that uh, the moon is special, OK? And it's important. We don't know if it's essential, but it's important. We also know that uh, we don't necessarily need plate tectonics, uh, but plate tectonics can happen in many different ways. There are so many different planets that we already know, exoplanets that uh, are not exactly the same, but very similar to the Earth. We know that there are other planets that don't look like the Earth at all that might be more habitable. So I don't know if things fell in place the right way for us, but there are maybe other places where things are even better, and we're discovering this. So uh, I don't think that too many people subscribe uh, anymore to the rare earth uh, hypothesis when you just look at the sheer number. And we also know that nature has ways to go around the kind of things that we know around here. 
Based on the research that you've done on Earth and what you know about some of the exoplanets that, that, that we know exist, what do you think is the most realistic find? What, what, what would the most realistic form of life look like in the early phases of discovery, do you think? I would say that when you're looking again at the at, uh, statistics, um, nature does a lot of small uh, and simple things and a lot less of complex and, and, and big things. You see this with mountains, you see this with lakes, you see this uh, everywhere. So even on Earth, um, still today, over 90% of all life on Earth is microbial. And it's really easy uh, uh, to form. I would say that it took, it, it took 80% of uh, the evolution of life to start making complex life. So my vision of it is that the universe is full of uh, little and simple things that do not build radio telescopes or, or big technology, but uh, a little less or a lot less of advanced life. But look at the numbers. Look at the numbers. Even in our galaxy, uh, between 200 and 400 billion stars, at least on average, one planet around those. And uh, if anything like our solar system, 200 moons, a number of them with habitable environments. How do you think that the James Webb Telescope uh, will contribute to your research? What does it add to the, the search for life on other planets? Already did. I mean, the first image of the web is a uh, revolution in cosmology awaiting for us. Uh, you see those galaxies in the red, completely shifted uh, in the red. We see them here. And there are so many so early in the history of, uh, of the universe. We were not expecting this. Uh, way, way uh, many more galaxies that we were expecting. All of these little islands in the, in the cosmos, they, they have hundreds of billions of, of planets. So the thing, though, is that the um, bricks of life, the, the elements that compose who we are, uh, they were formed only 10 billion years ago with a generation of stars like the sun. And, and other stars, but that generation, 10 billion years ago. So those very far away galaxies, they have young uh, um, stars, and those are rich in helium and hydrogen, but not heavy elements like the one that are forming us. So is there a generational aspect to uh, the uh, uh, creation of life? Who knows? But it's still 10 billion years ago. It took us about 4 billion years to get to the point where we are sending uh, spacecraft in, in space. So um, assuming that you had civilization showing up, you know, uh, uh, early, maybe uh, four billion years ago, there might be very, very ancient civilization out there, probably not on their uh, home planets, but spread, scattered already in the universe. I'm, I'm curious to know, uh, how and if and how your research informs the way that you perceive climate change. Uh, on the one hand, you're exposed to such limitless possibilities in terms of uh, on, in, under what conditions life can exist, also in terms of what humans are maybe capable of, of adapting to, but you're also, I imagine, acutely aware of how unique Earth is, at least in terms of what we know uh, of the rest of the universe. So how do you balance the two? I, I think this is one of the most important messages uh, of astrobiology. And astrobiology is about understanding co-evolution of life and environment. And uh, this is who we are. Um, a planet is going to give you the physical and chemical constraints for life to appear. That's going to be the type of life that you have because the conditions are such. But once life is here, it's going to modify the environment. The atmosphere you breathe today is a result of little green and blue algae uh, who injected uh, oxygen uh, in the atmosphere a long time ago. So as you go, life changes the environment, environment changes life. And we need to remember that balance. Today, this balance is off. Astrobiology is giving us the answer in front of us in the solar system. You see Venus, where you have a greenhouse effect gone wild. And uh, the temperature at the surface is 400 degrees C. I mean, this is not a place where you want to live or can live. Um, on Mars, on the other hand, you see what happens when water disappears. It's a desert. And so not only we have the lessons of what happens when a, a planet goes wild, but we also, as we're exploring, developing the tools, instruments, and technologies that we can use to take back, to look back at the Earth 
and, and support and help the monitoring of our own planet to help understand a little faster what's going on because we need answers very, very quickly now. That, that, that is for sure. Natalie Cabral, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Unfortunately, My that's pleasure. all we have time for. And as a reminder to our viewers, uh, her book, A Lobe de Nouveaux Horizons, On the Dawn of New Horizons, is out for now in French as well.